President Biden's message to China as he began to lay out his foreign policy doctrine at the State Department on Thursday. With me now, Beijing's representative in Washington. Ambassador Sui Tiankai has been China's ambassador to the United States since 2013. He received a master's degree from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in 1987 and has worked his way up through China's foreign ministry all the way to the top ever since. Ambassador Sui, a pleasure to have you back on. Good morning, Farid. So nice to see you. Um, so we had that statement of President Biden in the speech. We also had an exchange of uh, readouts of, the, of, the, of uh, descriptions of phone call that took place between America's top diplomat, Tony Blinken, and China's top uh, di uh, diplomat, Yang Jiechi. It all seems pretty tough. And uh, even the, the readouts uh, had a lot of uh, more tough language in them. Were you expecting a different start to the Biden foreign policy? Um, it seems as though uh, Yang Jiechi, uh, China's top lip diplomat, said that the four years of the Trump administration had been the lowest point in U.S.-China relations since the opening to China uh, on, in the Nixon administration. Do you think there is a new uh, atmosphere in Washington, or does it feel to you more like the Biden administration is continuing some of Donald Trump's hardline policies? Well, Farid, I think there are a few basic things here. So let me try to make my points one by one. First of all, China's development, China's growth has been made possible by the hard work of the Chinese people and our more than 40 years of reform and opening up. This is a historical fact. To say otherwise is against the facts and certainly not fair to the Chinese people. Internationally, China always stands for the basic norms governing international relations as embodied in the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter. We always support multilateral institutions, the international system centered on the United Nations, including, for instance, WHO, WTO, and a number of others. And we already contribute more troops than other permanent members of the Security Council to the UN peacekeeping operations. We are already contributing a great deal to the global economic growth, and we are ready to do more. For instance, we are working with a number of other countries to confront the current pandemic, to restore economic growth globally. And hopefully, there's, I believe there's such a need and potential for bilateral relations between China and the United States in all these areas, especially vis-a-vis -vis the emerging or already existing global challenges like climate change. For the readout for the phone call yesterday, frankly, my impression is that this readout is still, it still shows the example of power rather than the power of example. You don't have effective foreign policy just by talking tough or playing tough. This is not a way, not the way, the right way of doing diplomacy. I think there's a clear need for a good sense of mutual respect. People have to show good will and good faith. Of course, all countries have values and interests to defend. For China, national sovereignty, unity, territorial integrity, these are the core values and the core interests we will defend. We'll do whatever it takes to defend, no matter who says what. Um, but let me ask you about, you know, in some ways, this new tougher foreign policy, which has become a consensus. I mean, there are something like 400 pieces of legislation in the in the House, uh, in the United States Congress that are aimed at uh, in some way, uh, you know, standing up to China. Uh, this this new toughness comes in some part as a response to a new Chinese foreign policy, which has been itself much more aggressive. And, and you don't have to listen to the United States on this. If you ask the Australians, they find themselves facing a much more assertive China that is asking 
that Australian private think tanks do not do research that the Chinese government does not like. Uh, you find it when you talk to the Indians who feel that China has made incursions on a disputed border along the, the Himalayas. You find it in Japan where they think that China has pushed further its claims on the Senkaku Islands uh, in, in various ways. Uh, and of course, you find it uh, with, with Taiwan, with Vietnam. So this is something that is this sense that China is flexing its muscles is not one just felt in the United States. Um, is, there, is there a reason for this new Chinese foreign policy? I don't think we have an entirely new foreign policy. We have been very consistent in our foreign policy. It's a independent policy for peace. Of course, we safeguard our sovereignty and independence. There's no doubt about that. But for you, please look at the map. All the issues you mentioned and some other issues, they are either part of Chinese territory or in places very close to China. So who is on the offensive? Who is on the defensive? You just have a look at the map. It's all, always far away from the United States. The fact is, whenever you have more involvement by the United States, you have instability anywhere in the world. Look at the Middle East, look at some other places, Latin America. And it's, it's so obvious that when you are sort of rebalancing or pivoting, whatever the word might be, then there's more instability in our region. But, but, but Ambassador, if I, may, if I may just uh, interrupt you for a second, these places may be far yeah. from the United States, but they're not far from Australia, from India, from Vietnam, from Japan. And I don't take Washington's word for it. All I'm asking is, are you listening to your neighbors? You see, we have uh, more than a dozen neighbors on the land and more neighbors across the sea. And over the course of the history, Inevitably, there have been disputes among the neighboring countries. This is the same thing anywhere in the world. But basically, China and its neighbors have been able to address these disputes and solve them through dialogue and negotiation. For instance, we concluded treaties and agreement with most of our neighbors on the land about the borders. It's all done by peaceful negotiations. We still have a couple of them left, but we are ready to work with them, negotiate with them, and in the meantime, maintain stability and tranquility in the areas. So without external involvement, it will be easier and more possible for the neighbors to solve the issues between themselves. You mentioned the possibility of cooperation. Uh, and I want to ask you about two areas. One, you mentioned the possibility of cooperation, uh, and I want to ask you about two areas. One is climate change, which you mentioned, of course, and which is clearly very important to President Biden. Um, in return for cooperation on climate change, would China expect the United States to be, to be more understanding on other issues? I ask this because traditionally, the Chinese position has been there should never be linkage between issues. But are you now going to start linking progress on climate change to the United States um, being cooperative with China on certain other issues? Climate change is a global challenge. So what is at stake is the global community's interest, not only the interest of our two countries. Of course, our two countries have to play uh, uh, an important role in international cooperation to confront this challenge. But this is a true global challenge. So we would very, very much welcome any initiative the United States would like to take to rejoin us, for instance, in the Paris Accord and in other international and multilateral efforts. I don't think in this sense, I don't think that there should be any trade off of cooperation on climate change with other things. Even in the last few years, when the United States was out of the Paris Accord, China was still doing all the right things we believe we have to do for our own interest, but also in the interest of the global community. For instance, President Xi announced China's 
goal to reach peak emission before 2030 and to have carbon neutrality, to have carbon neutrality before 2060. We have done all these things, even when the United States was against such international initiative. initiative. Of course, we very much welcome the U.S. to come back to rejoin us. But honestly, Fred, many people are asking themselves, will the U.S. change its policy in a few years' time again? Hopefully, this will not be the case. Let me ask you about technology, because one of the areas that people worry that we are entering is a kind of technology cold war or a decoupling where we end up with a Chinese technology zone and a non-Chinese or a Western or American one. Um, isn't it fair to say that part of this has happened uh, because China has actually uh, been the one that began this process by essentially banning most of America's major technology companies from participating in China? I'm thinking of Google, Facebook. Um, there are virtually no, uh, none of America's major technology companies in China. And rather than opening up over time, liberalizing over time, as people expected, I think, in fact, the rules have gotten more restrictive in, in that area. Well, Farid, I think to be more accurate, all these companies, what they want is a major market share in China. I don't think that their goal is to share technology with China. They just want to make money on the Chinese market. Of course, they could come and we are open to all American companies, but there are existing and even mounting restrictions imposed by the United States government against all this flow of technology, free flow of technology and information. This has been the case for so many years, but especially for the last few years. I think technological progress should benefit everybody, so the entire global community and everybody in any society. But this issue has been so much politicized. This is very unfortunate. And we are back with China's ambassador to the United States, Sui Tiankai. Let me ask you about one of the most contentious issues that is going to confront U.S.-China relations, and that is what is going on in Xinjiang. You know now President Biden has described it as a genocide. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo did so. And the new Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, said he agrees with that judgment. Is there not a way, I know you've been on the show before and said that the, the, this is un, inaccurate, is there not a way for China to allow an international group of observers uh, free and total access, uh, interviews with uh, you know, any and all Uyghur groups that it, that it wants to determine whether or not these claims about, uh, about a cultural genocide are true? I think for the fact is, in the last few years, there have been more than 1,200 people, journalists, diplomats, and from more than 100 countries. Some of them are Muslim countries. All these foreign visitors have visited Xinjiang in the last few years. You cannot say they are all not independent. You cannot say they don't have any observation. They have seen the facts on the ground very clearly. Why don't people listen to these people? And the real threat, the real threat in Xinjiang, up until very recent, was very clear. First, the threat of terrorism. There have been thousands of terrorist attacks in Xinjiang, hurting and even killing thousands of innocent people, people from all ethnic groups, Han people, Uyghur people, and others. So, people have a strong demand that their safety and security should be guaranteed. That's what, what we have done in the last few years. Now, for the last few years, last three to four years, there has been no single case of terrorist attack. So, people have a much better sense of security and safety now. You say that we should listen to independent observers. Of course, uh, it's very hard for journalists to get there, but the BBC ha had some horrifying reports of labor camps that looked like prison camps and of guards 
who engaged in everything from sexual abuse to rape. Are you saying, you know, again, I ask you your response to that, but again, the simplest way to deal with this would be to welcome a group from uh, human, human rights organizations like Amnesty International or others to come in and, ma and make a thorough evaluation, because otherwise you do, f you do have independent reports such as uh, exist from the BBC only a, a week ago. Most of the sources are not trustworthy. I've been to Xinjiang myself more than once in the last few years. I have seen all these things with my own eyes. I even visited some of the vocational training center. It's just, just like a campus. It's not labor camp, it's campus. I don't know how the BBC people got all this wrong information or misinformation. But you see, if you look at their track record, maybe you should not have total trust of what they say. Let me ask you about a question that, that you know keeps coming up, uh, which is, uh, was the coronavirus uh, accidentally leaked from a, a lab in Wuhan? Uh, the people making these charges, to be clear, do not have uh, strong evidence, but that's largely because China has not allowed uh, teams of medical researchers to go in uh, and they have not shared data on that. So let me just ask you this. On the, on the theory that the truth will eventually come out, um, would you categorically say that from all China's investigations, the coronavirus emerged from a wet market in Wuhan and not from the Wuhan Virology Institute lab? I think when people make accusations, they have to prove these accusations. And to say these things at a time when we're still faced with the pandemic is against the spirit of humanitarianism. Besides, now an expert group from WHO is working in Wuhan with their Chinese counterparts. They are working very hard. They are trying to look at all the facts. And we are very supportive to their work. And I have also participated in some of the conferences between experts real experts of our two countries. They are real scientists. They are looking at the whole pandemic from the point of view of scientists, not any politicians. So I think people have to be careful not to make groundless accusations. Also, there have been a number of media reports about early cases in other places in the world. So there is certainly a need for more tracing to be done all over the world in order to really trace down the origin of the virus so the human race could be better prepared when we are faced with another virus again. So please do not politicize the whole issue. Please let the scientists do their professional job. And will scientists be allowed full access to China if, uh, from the WHO? They are already in Wuhan. They have been in Wuhan for quite a few days. My question is, will they be allowed to come here to do the same thing? Ambassador, it is so important for us to hear from you, and we thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Farid.